Yeah, if anyone sees any yeah, go ahead. Uh, with two polyps sticking out, let me know. I'm just seeing one. Could you pan to the right just a little bit, Jess? Sure. Yeah, a small bump. Yeah, they, they look... I'm only seeing one. I, I want to think there's something different, but you know, I just don't know. Yeah, I'm seeing one here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you for that. At least we documented it. Sure thing. And move on. Okay. Summit or bust? Summit or bust? So Mesos off. Interesting. So it's a meso. Yeah. Took a, took a while to. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's fine. We don't need that. No, we can use this for the rest of the night. Do you want me to? Do I have to do this ab abort trying? Yeah. Right. Looks like we got a couple corals coming into view here. Very, very large. Oh, uh, ground fault's back. Ah. So it's not the meso. Right. You want to put that back There's on? There's some more of those. What, it looked like anemones yeah. or something? Yeah. We're going to try to restart again. It's a decent size hold fast for that coral on the right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, the there, there have been a few studies that have um, pretty uh, done, done some pretty good regression analyses on uh, diameter of the bases of bamboo corals and uh, ages, mm. and that's one of the few groups that we generally have a pretty good handle on being able to reasonably estimate age from just looking at base diameter. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, but again, these a lot of these studies are really highly localized to. Uh, certain bodies of water, like the Gulf of Mexico or, or the Pacific extent. coast Sorry. of uh, North America. And so doing that here might not necessarily yield the same kind of accurate age information, just because the oceanography is different, how these uh, the species are different, how these animals grow are, are slightly different, the growth rates. Um, so we, we are still stuck with estimations very coarse estimations at that. Oh, I just lost the still cam. Cycle power on that? Yeah, sorry, we're troubleshooting okay. a ground fault up here. I just wanted to make a note. Yeah, that's your thing. Rick Mezzo doesn't want to come back over there. I think All I right, we're... Closing in on what is the presumed summit area of this part of this uh, small ancient volcano. Steve, will we want to take an eDNA sample at the summit here? Um, yeah, we'll take a look and see what's what kind of things we have there. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable idea. Um, I just want to see what the density looks like. Yeah. Sure thing. And Beth, you want to get a rock sample? Potentially. Uh, again, I kind of see, like, what does the summit look like if in, if the rocks look any different than what we've seen? Roger. Um, yeah, we're definitely going to run up against the time window. Yeah. We get there. Do we have time to do a partial zoom on that white stick off to the left side? This yeah, one here? One. Sure. It looks yeah, sure a little thing. bit different. What are you trying now, Jake? So sea cucumber also off to the left. This is the second one of these I see I saw and I thought I was seeing things at first, but it seems to be a, a trend. What do you think it is? 
I don't know yet. Okay. Gotcha. I have a couple of suspicions, but first thing I want to do is establish that it, it's a uh, coral and not some sort of other animal. Here is all right. You can try that one out. Yeah, this looks remarkably similar to that unidentified white um, octavore we sampled a few days okay. ago. Yeah. The one that you thought might have been stolen at Stoloniferous. Oh. There was also something to the left of that. Um, Do we have any more zoom on that? Because I'm trying to figure out if the polyps are arising from the skeleton, um, or if it's something overgrowing another skeleton. Are those mushroom curls in the background too branched like you were talking for before? I, th I, th I do think a couple of them might actually be uh, multi-polyp. This is a little bizarre, uh, and I'd love to get Asako's uh, take on this. Um, it looks like there might be some eggs in the bot in the very base of some of these polyps, so right. mm -hmm. indicating you know, re a reproductive mode. Yeah, but there it's are. A, it's an octocoral for sure. I just I can't be certain if it's uh, like a stoloniferent overgrowing something or if it's arising from the skeleton. I'm I'm tending to lean to the latter. Um, yeah. But if that's the case, I don't know what this octocoral is. Um, Steve, while you're looking at that, I just want to yeah. point out in the background that we do have a... Yeah, and the Mastis colonies. Yeah. There's All also right. something else to the, to the port. Right. The port one uh, before we pick up. Well, since Were you able to get some stills or is the I, camera still down? Uh, no, I've been able to get still uh, screen grabs. Yeah. Okay. The All right. Anything else you want to look at or else I'm going to... Oh, that, that, that looks to be it. Okay. Full wide, please. And we, we definitely have that, that yellow colony off to the See right was definitely there. acanthogorgia. Steve, or, right. uh, oh. Just uh, to the right. Sorry. To the left of the lasers. I don't think we've seen that before. Right there. That little, little feather looking guy. Uh, yeah. I think. What is that? It might be a bathypathies kind of at an odd angle. Oh, you think? Okay. Because I wasn't sure. It looked like a rock pen or something. You can go ahead and do a snap zoom there if you want. No, you're right. Yep. Bathy pathies it is. Raj, full away, please. And he can even identify them sideways. <laughs> How about <laughs> top down? <laughs> <laughs> Almost there. A little further. So what's left to be tried out there, Jake? Yeah. Our viewers are becoming quite the coral ID experts here. <coughs> Sorry. We welcome the input. We're yeah. closing in on maybe the top of whatever this summit is. Yeah, so it looks like um, I, I'm going to lean that this is this um, white unidentified coral that we were looking at a while ago is something distinct, um, and it's not some sort of opportunistic stoloniferin because they all seem to be roughly the same morphology and density of polyps, uh, and there's no evidence that um, yeah, they, no evidence that there's uh, they're overgrowing any other kind of Coral, mm -hmm. but I can't. I couldn't put it to a family, honestly. Um, other than saying it's an octocoral for now. Do some digging on that. Get back to you. Yeah, and if anybody out there on the World Wide Web wants to do some image searches, <laughs> help us out. Please feel free. Um, someone's asking Steve. So you you're you don't think it's a stoloniferin? I, th that was one of my suspicions, but we've seen them 
so regularly, all the colonies are roughly the same shape, that stoloniferans um, are usually a little bit more irregular. And if it was a stoloniferan, I would expect it to be um, attached to different kinds of hard substrates. Uh, and they all seem to be growing in this stick morphology. Uh, so my suspicion is that this is a, it's a, a, a coral. Is that, that, that coral is actually producing that skeleton. Interestingly, some of the bigger sponges that were seen earlier in the dive um, on some of the steeper slope, we haven't seen any of those up here. It's a bit steeper terrain. You can see an Argus sonar coming up. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to work for this to get to this summit. Yeah. Oh, and of course I said that, and here come some sponges. <laughs> Ooh, that's oh, wow. Interesting one to the left there, huh? Yeah, look at that one. Can we look at that a little closer? Yeah, let's do it. Have we seen that on this dive before, or this expedition? That particular sponge? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, we, I don't we, recall seeing it. We were it. debating... Um, during, just after dinner, we had seen something. Uh, this is the one that like the kind that uh, Chris sampled on the earlier shift. Uh, it was whiter, though. It was. He decided against it. He thought it was a heterocone. Couldn't fish on in there, partial. Um, but this one is probably texture. not living. Yeah. Okay. Um, it does look a little decrepit. Yeah. Decrepit. Okay. But it, it it does. It's very reminiscent of that. Yeah. You're right. All right Thanks, Jess. Full ride, please. Got seven minutes, guys. We can do it. We're going to do it. I feel like someone needs to play Eye of the Tiger or something. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> or the final countdown. Yeah, I think too. The, the consensus from scientists ashore and here uh, is that that, that uh, unbranched little whip thing is uh, definitely some kind of coral that's producing its own skeleton arising, you know, the polyps are arising from the skeleton. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Because if, if it was a stoloniferin, you might see it, you know, you it might be on the base or it might be on the branch tips, but it seems to be uniformly... Yeah polyp density throughout the colony. <coughs> is the observation of what you thought maybe are eggs, is that is that often seen? It, it that that's the place that where they would be yeah. if they were gravid. Yeah. They um, have a tendency so with you see this with Chrysogorgia a lot. The polyps are so small that when when they start to produce eggs and sperm they form these sacs at the very base of the polyp. You see this often in sea pens as well. And um, sometimes, yeah, it can inflame and, and swell the tissue a little bit when they get particularly close to spawning. Um, and, and the color also is a giveaway. It turns kind of yolky. Okay. Um, yeah, more opaque than uh, translucent. But, you know, as we talked about, I think, on another day about reproduction uh, in the deep ocean, we don't know really if, um, you know, we, we only have snapshots, right? We, we don't right. know where it is in the reproductive process, all that it is. It's uh, strongly associated with, you know, in the production of um, Roger. gametes. Oh, that's neat. I hadn't, hadn't seen that. Asako had just noticed noted that sometimes with corals you can see the planula larvae uh, swimming inside of polyps mm. you know, if they're if they're uh, brooders potentially that'd be cool i hadn't seen that myself that's really neat come on summit So that's the completion of our last ship move. Another okay. couple meters. Argus has probably 20 meters to swing. Okay. Um, 
and then Niskin and Yeah, Mark Steve, do we want to take a Niskin? I was just going to say that. Yeah, I think this is the spot okay. to do it. Okay. Can we uh let's pause around here, Jess, and try to fire that Niskin. Sure thing. Got several different coral species in view. Yeah. In, in this case, we don't want to be too far off bottom, maybe a couple meters maximum. Okay. Um or whatever you're comfortable with because we want to try and keep ourselves within the sphere of influence of this, these corals. Sure. So this is going to be sample 108. 108, roger. And we're going for Niskin's 5, 4, or 2. Uh, 5, 4, 2. Auto XY on USVL is a danger zone. That's a very good point. Thank you. It might be all right, unless we get a stray ping. And then <laughs> <laughs> You want to turn on that porch light there, Jake? Yep. Thanks. Steve, I immediately forgot the number you told me. 542. Oh, sorry. 108. 108. Yeah. Let me go for the low hanging fruit. Seven. Sorry, I'm a little bit high now. All right. All right, channel three, you can see the Niskins. And once Jess pulls on one of the lanyards, we should see, I think, bottle four pop. Bottle four should be popping now. Oh, there we go. Bottle four. All right. All right. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right, and for your logs, there were 2.8 off the, off the back. 2.8 off the back. Uh, That's off the back, not the front. Oh, we don't have top bar on. So, so never mind. Might be an old hit. Might be. Somewhere around two yeah, meters. Around. Right. Does that switch over? Do you have an altimeter on that, aside from Doppler? Uh, yeah, we should. Yeah, the pair. No, it's only depth. No, we don't. Yeah. So we don't know. There's a really Something. pretty sponge right over here Looks to like the left. Yeah. We'll go with 2.8. Um... We'll just do a quick look this way, but we're going to have to go if we yep. want to see the top. There's a nice bunch. Yeah, let, we can go to the top. Yeah, it looks like Argus has a view of possibly the the top-ish. Mm -hmm. Herc might be seeing. We'll see if we... Well, we don't know. Oh, wait. Herc Mezzo never came back. Mm -hmm. No. I don't get that Only the, the Sea King. Yeah, so however far out you can see in the Sea King, if there's any... Returns once we meters. get up there. Yeah. Several more corals in view. How's your wrap situation? Easily? We've definitely transitioned into a, a, resolved, yeah. a new uh, community uh, as we've gone up uh, shallower in depth. We still have some of the deeper representatives like the Hemicorellium, uh, Romula gorgia, the Candidella, but you know we're also getting these more shallow species like the Plexorids and the Acanthogorgids. Might so this here. is kind of a transit, a bit of a transition community. The edge of the leash um, is the edge of the leash. Yeah. Bathymetrically. All right, Beth, so this is, we're pretty much at the summit. You can kind of see it peter out in Argus there a bit. Yeah. Um, did you want to rock real quick? We'll have to pull the dive uh, pretty much now-ish. So do you want to rock real quick? Um, I don't know if I want these because they I'm determining their in-situ province is a little bit awkward. But maybe. Uh, yeah, why not? Let's get one okay. if we have time. Yeah, we can uh, grab a quick one. Quick grab one. a quick one, yeah. yeah. You're going to get yanked or you're right. Yeah. Yeah, sure. There we go. That'll be good. All right. Um, anything in the foreground look snaggable to you? Let's go for that one. That might be a little too big. 
Yeah, it looks a little bit big. Okay. Uh, let's go for this angular one right here. Roger. Or, wait, should we get this? <laughs> All right. So, so just at yeah. the same time I did. Yeah, let, let's, <laughs> let's go for this so that go we for can the get the twofer. Roger. Yeah. So you can get those mushroom corals, too. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> All right. I think that's called convergence of thought. Okay, snap zoom in there, please, Jeff. They're just out there waving their hands like, pick me, yeah. pick me. <laughs> All right, you got your screen grabs back there, Steve? Yes, we do. Pull away, please. So the... Um, with the with with all of these mushroom corals, would you use any of these for microbes or? Yeah, I would like to. Um, we should confer on that in the lab. What the best way is to do that? Um, yeah. But I think it would be good to have the biological specimens, but then also taking uh, representative pieces to see what the microbiome yep. is, and then how that compares to the microbiome of the rock. I agree. There's a big it. rock. Be a oh. Interesting. oh, oh, sorry, little guys. Um, one more time, or do you guys? That uh, I didn't see any evidence that it was gonna move. Yeah. All right. Roger. But I've been wrong before. That's pretty solid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other rocks over here, or else we're gonna pull it. There's um, another one with um, corals on it to the top, top left. left. Yeah. There's right also there. that one. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that these are going to come out. Yeah. It doesn't look like it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let. Um, I don't want to inflict any more harm here. So I think we'll go ahead and call this. All right. Roger. Full wide. Let's line up. Over here, I'm just going to drop these plates. Yep. Thankfully, Sounds there's good. several other representative pieces like this in this area. Well, all in all, good sample recovery on this dive, on this seamount that has never been explored before. We've got some good representative rock samples, both for, hopefully that'll have some nice intact interiors for the dating and age work. And um, your first push core. We got a push core. We got some water samples. We've seen new representative species, distributions. Yeah, um, let's just start coming up and then we can... All right. Randy, what's going to be our recovery, I guess? Oh, we don't know yet. Um, but right now, our current heading is uh, something. Where, where? Uh, 80, 8080. 080 zero zero. Zero zero range. So you'll go uh, 260, something like that. Roger that. Go ahead and spin around there, Jake. Yep. I don't know. They drop if they want to drop those midwater, just FYI. Oh, both of them, you mean? If you're going to drop the other one, I don't know if they want to drop it midwater because of the animals. Got it. And, uh, so now permit, that we're. Yeah. Um, It'll be okay. We can try. Coming towards the end of our work on the seafloor at the seamount, um, pilots, once you yeah, are in a good so. position, let us cool. know so that we can do our um, release of this work. Observe the release. Uh, sure, we're just going to get set up. Yep. Jake, you going to come up on the delta, please? Coming up. Yeah, you can come up to 20, then I'll move around you. Thanks. And I think you're going to go to 080. How many different coral species do you think we saw on this dive? Zero, oh, zero, zero. zero. Yeah. Any. Okay. I, yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's probably 
at least 30 or, yeah. or more. It's, and you know, it, um, yeah, keep up there. we're kind of in the, yeah. the hot spot depth range right? between 1800, uh, 17, 1800 and 2300 is generally um, kind of the peak diversity for mm -hmm. the deep sea. You know, as you get into the shallow ocean, of course, diversity is higher for a lot of things. But uh, yeah, I, we, we suspect, or I suspect that um, these transition zones, wherever you have species of overlapping distribution ranges, um, you tend to end up with higher diversity. So this might be one of them. I've looked yeah. at uh, coral diversity patterns for my own research uh, in both the Pacific and the Atlantic, and this seems to hold true to those. These observations I seem to hold right. true to those uh, depth range uh, maxima, divers diversity maxima. In the Atlantic, it's a bit shallower. Peak diversity is somewhere around 12 to 1500 meters. Um, in the North Atlantic, rather. Uh, but in this part of the Pacific, yeah, it's generally 17, 1800, down to 2300. So. Okay, you're uh, All right, let's try coming up there, Jake. Logging off bottom there. Roger. Once you get dialed in, we'll uh, switch over to the back row. Just another second there. So for our audience at home, we're on our way back up to the surface. We should be recovering the vehicle around midnight Hawaii time. Uh, and the intention is to do our next dive starting at 8 a.m. tomorrow, Hawaii time. Okay. We might be diving a little bit shallower, uh, similar depths of where we ended tonight's dive. So. Who knows what we'll find? We'll be diving on a seamount we have not visited yet before. You all good for this? All right, um, back row, we're all ready here to... Okay, Lindsay, could you set us up? Sure, yeah, so if you've been following along on these dives, we're gonna take a moment here to go off microphone and we'll be grounding ourselves in the release. It's a sort of a thank you and a part of our Hawaiian cultural protocols to observe this time to remove ourselves and release ourselves from this task and move on to the next. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna invite everyone in the control van to go ahead and mute your microphones. We'll be back on SPL shortly.
Mahalo. Okay. Sure thing, Rennie. Okay. Now we've got blue water for a little bit of time. Lindsay, how many people do we still have joining us tonight? Uh, we have about 30 or so valiant watchers sticking with us here from around the world, really. We've got folks from all over, including some late watchers in the North America and Hawaii, a number of watchers in South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and Europe. Oh, Japan is represented here as well. And Iran. Well, great. Thanks to everybody that's tuned in. Um, question for our ROV team. We were curious about what that metal plate was that we dropped right before ascending. Yeah, it's our, so we drop plates. Um, these are steel plates and they have this little uh, fibrous, it's a natural fiber line on it. Um, and so that is basically offsetting. It, we have a ballast so it we can kind of fly even in the water, if you will. And as we pick up rocks, we uh, want to be throwing off some of these plates so that we can maintain always like a, a positive um, buoyancy in the water. So if you see us throwing off those plates, it just means that we're collected a bunch of rocks, which makes our scientists happy. And the nice thing is that that will kind of degrade relatively quickly over time. So. How much does one plate weigh, Jess? You know, I should know this off the top of my head, and it's a <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're heavy um, <laughs> when you lift them on deck. Uh, and two, are they? Two? I don't know. The singles are ten. Ten or fifteen. Ten or fifteen. Yeah. So they're pretty heavy. Okay. Yeah, we can. We can usually. Do, well, there's a spreadsheet downstairs that we can kind of do a ballast calculation. So we just say how many of these Alvin plates we call them. <laughs> so I've gotten lazy, I think, and yeah. knowing the exact numbers. We can kind of get an estimate too about, um, we have something called a Z bias. So that's basically the amount of uh, vertical thrust that we're going to be compensating um, any type of weight that we have. Um, mm -hmm. So if, you, if we were trimming the Z bias, we noticed that we're, we had to thrust down. We had to kind of, if we're too floaty, we're going to be trying to thrust down into the surface, which is good. If we're too heavy, we're going to be trying to thrust up more. And then at that, that point, we know that we should take off one of these plates. So it's more by feeling and fly, when you're flying. Um, so you can adjust the ballast on the fly that way, too. OK. Hey, That's Beth, I'm old, uh, down here in the lounge. Um, did you intend to get a uh, background niskin? No, Steve uh, says that we don't need to do that. Okay. Um, I'm uh, writing up a, a summary here. So I understand this dive to have been, you know, more the biological communities to have been more patchy, but also more diverse than the previous two dives on Don Quixote. Is that accurate? Uh, Steve will respond. Um, so we, we entered a, a depth that we had not um, spent too much time in on previous sites so access to that to that depth could have um, yeah led to the observation of higher diversity of corals at this site um, but yeah it's just a it's just a anecdote anecdotal evidence right now I can't yeah. say for certain yeah yeah that makes sense we also had that really strong current evidence of current which we also had on the Don Quixote dives but and um, how many samples did we collect, biological and geological? On this dive? Yep. Fourteen. 
14 total. Yeah, 14. Roger, thank you. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> We're getting a lot of complaints of strobing in channel three, so warnings to anyone who might be sensitive to light, and also a reminder that you can turn on channel one only or channel two only and not have to look at channel three and strobing, especially right now as there's not a lot to see and most of what you might happen to notice will be on channel one or two from Argus or Hercules at this point. Yeah, so if you're just tuning in here, we've wrapped up our dive on this unnamed seamount just southwest of the Don Quixote Seamount. We've spent about 12 hours underwater on this dive and collected 15 different geological and biological samples, so pretty successful. We're going to be making our ascent here for over the next two hours, and we'll be recovering the vehicles on deck around midnight, Hawaii Standard Time. And then we're going to do a quick transit over to our next dive site, another seamount not that far away that was mapped previously on this expedition. And the estimated launch time for that next dive is going to be 8 a.m. Hawaii Standard Time. So for those of you who may need to go catch up on some rest, now is a great time to uh, <laughs> say goodnight, although we hate to see anyone go. <laughs> we'll hopefully see you back here at Then you'll get to see tomorrow. us again at 8 a.m. That's right. We'll be back. Blue water going up, blue water coming down. Got a ring to it. <laughs> yeah, but we can keep an eye out for those Tina Forest now. We've got a little bit of time. Still. Oh, was there a particular depth where Tina Forest have been no, observed? No, but Rennie was saying something about Tina Forest okay. uh, earlier in the dive, so I was Tina Forest. You say tuna fours or tunicates? Tunicates actually was what I asked. You said tunicates? Yeah. Oh, I thought you said tuna fours. Then you were talking about tuna fours, and I was I got into that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we so can look for both. I, I rolled with it. But I was saying that we hadn't seen many tunicates on the bottom. Look for salps. On the way up, pelagic tunicates. For our audience who may not know what a tuna four is. You might also not know that it is spelled with a silent C. <laughs> I did not know that. C T E N O P H O R E. It's another name for comb jellies. Every watch, I'm learning something, guys. Yes. So keep your eyes peeled for some cool, flashy critters that might come through our screens. If we saw a Tina for that, it'd be pretty cool. Or a tunicate. <laughs> Jake, is the Argus view currently facing downward? Yes. Cool, thanks. Now our viewers would like to know more about tunicates. Oh, oh, I we're, I'm not, I can't. I would just point you to the internet because <laughs> I do not know much about them. Maybe Steve can chime in, but he's a little busy at the moment. I know that tunicates have a larval notochord, making them very closely related to vertebrates. But that's all I know. Get Steve to say more. Uh, do we take questions from kids that may not be scientific? Maybe. Depends on the question. You can always send the question whether or not we'll answer it. <laughs> it's up to us. I don't know what a, lar what a larval stage of a tunicate looks like to know what I would be looking for.
Steve, now folks would like to know more about tunicates. Oh boy. Or, uh, or tuna force. I'm, I'm on the edge of my uh, knowledge base here. Aren't we getting close to vertebrates when we talk about tunicates? Yeah, yeah, getting there. Yeah, they've got a nerve cord. Let's see. What 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 are some deep sea tunicates? Yeah, I I, I generally I generally prefer the other end of the invertebrate tree of life. Mm. There's some really creepy looking predatory deep sea tunicates. Oh yeah, like uh, th th those are actually pretty interesting. You should typically will. I think we're a bit. We're a bit shallow where we're diving at these depths for to see those, but if you go deeper than 3,000 meters, those become more common, the, the carnivorous tunicates, Megal uh, megalodicopia, I think, the genus. Kind of looks like a invisible Venus flytrap. Mm -hmm. Super cool. Yeah. Aren't they actually have a, um, interestingly, they have a commensal polychaete that lives inside. Oh, yeah? That is not eaten, but... I guess uh, somehow has some sort of symbiosis with this uh, organism. What makes them particularly carnivorous? Since aren't all filter feeders carnivorous? Um, I, I think it's the, it's it's more so. Most tunicates are filter feeders. I think it's it's that these capture prey Larger. whole okay. and consume them whole by, you know, digesting them extracellularly. Hmm. Hmm. But, you know, I've never really, I don't think, it, I, I don't know if there's any good evidence of like actual prey capture on these. I'm sure somebody must have seen something in order to confirm that they are carnivorous, but um, I've never seen evidence of active predation. And you, you talked about the benthic tenophores earlier, right? Those were the ones that sit on the polyps and extend their tentacles. How big are those? Oh, very small. And maybe a, a centimeter okay. or a few centimeters at most. But the tentacles can reach several tens of centimeters sometimes. Really impressive. Somebody thinks that the predatory tenophores look like a real-life Pac-Man. <laughs> kind of oh, cool. real what? Pac-Man. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Tu tunicate or tinafore. Tunicate, sorry, uh, yeah. predatory tunicate. tunicate. Hey, front row, uh, what is our ascent rate? Coming up currently around currently making 18, so that varies as we go. Yeah, okay. I actually should switch in my direction soon. Yeah, we're... Did you say 18? We slow down a bit when we... Uh, so that we the starboard bio box is actually directly under one of the vertical thrusters. Mm -hmm. So there's a magic trick where we use some laterals that allow it to push the thrust out over the box. Um to go up faster. So that's why we kind of do these little semicircles as we ascend. Oh, yeah. Uh, but one way is much faster than the other. So 18, I think, is the fast one. So it looks like we're closer to 15. Renny, I'm looking at our high pack view. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you put in a marker for where we dropped our weights. And you refer to them as Alvin weights. For yeah. our viewers at home, why are they called Alvin weights? Sure. Um, everyone who I've met that's been on the Alvin team does not like that name because <laughs> everyone uses them. Yes. Not just the Alvin submarine, but it's named after the Alvin submarine. I was using uh, them for ballast for many, many years and when other ROV operations and submersibles, um, you know, kind of started ordering the same weights from the same companies, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, just called them Alvin weights. But it makes it seem like Alvin's the only one dropping them down, which is not the case. Alvin is a Woods Hole submersible. Um, recently, 
reworked to go much deeper than its original threshold. 6,500 6, meters. 6,500, yeah. but I believe that that project is now put on pause. Yep, they're still working towards Market demonstrating work. that. Yes. We wish our colleagues at Woods Hole luck with yes, getting that all worked out. We have a bunch of questions coming through here. Tunicate is spelled T-U-N-I-C-A-T-E. Yes, correct. Um, second, curious about what happened to the 20 minute 20 meters a minute surfacing rate that would happen with the ONC. Is that is that true, Renato? Would they master um, a sense? Sometimes we could. That that's quite fast. I mean, we we can sometimes make that if if we didn't if we brought weights down and didn't and. Um, didn't pick often, anything up. Yeah, is that because there were no we, bio boxes? We would go down pretty heavy because we'd have a lot of gear on, on Hercules. And then when, once we get to the bottom, we unload that gear. And also, sometimes we have weights beyond that. And we weren't always picking up a lot on Hercules. So um, I can imagine there were some some dives, not all of them, but sometimes we could make a faster ascent just because we were a bit floatier. Um, but it's a bit of a different... Uh, yeah. Different scenario. Then we have a, yeah, thanks. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have a question for Jeff. Really? Yes. What type of stuff do stuff. you use to get such beautiful live feeds? What kind of stuff? Um, You've opened a Pandora's box. Oh, well, yeah. That's <laughs> by asking <laughs> Jeff about the things in front of him. <laughs> um, there is a, a high-definition camera mounted on both vehicles. And that's the, the primary imager that you're seeing at home. And it is the same camera that's used to broadcast virtually every other HD sporting event. It's actually a small box camera. It, it looks like a box and mounted in a very expensive pressure vessel so it doesn't get crushed. And it has a really, really nice piece of glass, a really nice lens on the front of it. So that all combines to making a really nice, pretty picture. Is compression ever an issue? The Well, on the vessel, no. What you see at home, yes. On the vessel, we don't. Um, it's, it's uncompressed baseband HD video. Comes up the fiber from the vehicles and is recorded on two uh, Cinedec recorders at full HD bandwidth. What you see at home is basically the equivalent of taking a telephone pole and shoving it into a pencil sharpener. So we go from one and a half gigabit HD signal to 1.5 megabit picture at home. So you're not seeing nearly the resolution that we do here. It's a good metaphor. Whoa. Telephone pole and a pencil sharpener. Telephone pole. I mean, it really is about that. That's not much of an <laughs> exaggeration. It's a. T it's a telephone bowl into a pencil sharpener, we're, we're, we're throwing away about 90% of the information, actually 99% of the information by the time you see it at home. I'll put you on camera, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> we're good. Just Is that a threat? Or a we were just trying to imagine what that would look like. I mean, that, yeah. that's, a, that's a lot. Yeah. I, I, I don't know who to give credit <laughs> to for that one. That I mean, that was some somebody when, when HD was first being broadcast and we were talking about compression and, and what you see at home and they said yeah it's like shoving a, a telephone pole into a pencil sharpener it's like, okay, good analogy it's a really good analogy I like it you can really picture it he's so many splinters <laughs> <laughs> all right another follow-up what is so are we getting 4k feed here in the van negative we we um we've, we have experimented with 4k cameras on Little Herc, and um, while they do make beautiful pictures, we, the video team, I should say the video team, isn't necessarily totally happy with the performance of the camera. Mm. Is that the political, like, did I do that okay? Sure. <laughs> okay. Very well. Very good. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. Great to hear your voice. And speaking of throwing away data, 
Okay, that's not a good segue. <laughs> okay. Where are going with that? Yeah. I don't know where. <laughs> what, I don't want to know where you're going with that one. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna go over to our data logger. Um, Steve, what kind of data are you tracking, collecting, recording during the live dive? Uh, what am I doing personally? I'm I'm writing notes and observations of what we're seeing on the cameras, um, which is just a very small part of the data we collect. Um, we also collect data, uh, notes and observations again on sample collections. Um, but while this is all going on, we're also collecting data from a number of sensors on the vehicle that are getting uh, captured and stored in uh, our uh, ship's computers uh, that allow us to go back and look at temperature, salinity, oxygen profiles, depth profiles, um, all the navigation data that's being aggregated. Um, so all of that is happening in real time, not by me, but by computers on the ship. Cool. We're also getting video uh, images, screen captures, the computer on the send. Steve, do you have the best job? <laughs> That's going to be a loaded answer. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I'm going to rephrase that question. <laughs> If you were not able to do your current job here on here, which job would you choose? Here okay, so I have a, have a, a concrete answer for this, and um, I don't know if it's still up, but OET had a poll or like a quiz a number of years ago oh, yeah, on the yeah. Nautilus website. Yeah. It's still up there. Mm -hmm. I remember yeah. that. It it asks you some questions and it assigns you a job based on your answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. And my assigned role was ROV engineer. Okay. Oh. oh. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to go with that, but. Uh, I want to take this poll. I do too. Yeah, it was pretty cool. You can, yeah, you can get assigned like expedition leader or, you know, chief scientist or All right, navigator. So search for core of exploration career quiz. You oh, go. you already know what it is? Just found it. Yeah, no, oh, there it is. It's still up there. Did you agree with the results, Steve? Um. Yeah. 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 I landed pretty solidly in my current job, so wasn't. I guess it makes it a good quiz, but also <laughs> not as exciting. <laughs> as an you just love your job. Yeah. What is the quiz called? It's called "What Ocean Exploration Job Is Right for You." Oh. Ah. Yeah, I, I always thought it would be nice to try a day in someone else's shoes on the ship. Might not be the safest idea, but uh, <laughs> certainly uh, <laughs> certainly entertaining. I, I, we keep jonesing for the crane, and I agree. It's probably not really safe to put me on the crane, <laughs> but darn it, I want to drive the crane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many people in here are trained on the crane? Uh, Two? Me, me and Jess, yeah. Jess, Jake, if you were not driving an ROV, which job on Nautilus would you want? And why? Mm. Uh, I would have to go with know. Navigator. Notice none of them say video. <laughs> <laughs> no one jumps right out and says, we want I, to be the video. I considered it. I considered it. I have not taken the quiz, though, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I'd probably, in the control van, uh, yeah, probably navigator. Well, we can switch. Now, how about we do captain? Yeah, I'd be captain. <laughs> captain. What about cookie baker? Is that a job? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it is definitely a job. Makes people it's happy. Insanely. Deck chief. Deck chief. Yeah, there you go. Yes. That can be arranged. Pick your favorite You can tool. see the lasers and Ar the Argus butt cam. See Herc's lasers. Uh, right? Oh wow! Is that them, or are they light reflecting? I think that's. I think that's. I think that's Herc's lasers. Crazy. Pew, pew. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Argus butt cam. Totally right. Really. 
Even though we're facing. Oh no! Yeah. No, what? it's gotta be. It's gotta be glare. It must be like. Or is it far out? Oh, it could be. Just like yeah, looking yeah. into the distance. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I see. What oh, you're a saying. crane is one of your favorite tools. <laughs> is that an, is oh. that an option? Yeah. That's awesome. Pick your favorite tool: camera, wrench, map, computer, <laughs> sample tray, or crane. Crane for sure. That's not even a yeah, question. It's like the coolest mm. thing. Of all yeah. the of all the lab tools, I don't think sample tray would be in my top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't need any of the other things. I just want the tray. <laughs> yeah. Tray. <laughs> Trays are actually really handy. Well, it sounds like <laughs> it sounds like you got a choice back then. <laughs> I'm gonna go with map. Maybe rock saw. I yeah. like maps. Uh, rock saw. Yeah. So for those of you wondering what quiz we're talking about, if you search for core of exploration Google quiz, the quiz is called "What Ocean Career is Right for You." What ocean exploration ocean job is right for you? Sorry, I'm going backwards. I got mariner. Nice. Oh, I'm gonna nice. pick this one just because it has crocodile Dundee in it. <laughs> I need to retake this quiz. I don't remember it. Jeff, if you couldn't be behind cameras, what job would you have? Oh, did you already say you want to drive the crane? Oh, I got Mariner too. I, you know, um, certainly the navigator position is an interesting position, and I don't, I, a lot of people don't understand the situational situational awareness that the navigator has to have, thinking in three dimensions, and. You know, if you ever watch any of the navigators, it's like you might have heard uh, Jess ask Rennie to turn the stick lock on. But, oh, well, that's not a navigator job. That's an ROV job. But <laughs> the navigators are, are they've kind of got their hands in everything. And then the downside to it is, is what people who are watching us don't realize is as soon as we, we're not diving and the boat's moving, the boat's mapping. And the navigators are responsible for the mapping. And so... Quite often, you'll see them kind of look like zombies because we've gone from <laughs> navigator <laughs> mode. You look like a really great zombie. Thank you. Yes. I mean, you look like a great zombie, but it's just you can tell that the navigators, and it's not just Rennie, it's all of them, kind of have this glazed over look because they've gone from <laughs> yeah. mapping and looking She's at this data better. to, oh, hey, by the way, now you have to figure out two ROVs in three dimension space that, that have a five minute delay between where this ROV is now and where it's going to be later. Right. And well, what Jeff's also not saying is he's an airplane pilot, and I think that this seat would appeal to him, and, yeah. that, and he'd be good at it as well. Yeah, the, the navigator seat is interesting, but I, I have to say over the last few days, I've been hanging over the back uh, deck looking, and, and the whole deck operations fascinates me, and I think it fascinates most people. Well, get out there, man. The choreography. Do the no, tuggers. I'm not allowed to, um, uh. although I do have steelies downstairs just in case there's an emergency. Yeah. Um, me but too. Watching that choreography and um, is is fascinating. And anybody who comes onto this boat and and gets the chance to stand up on that, you know, on the back deck, because we have, we have a couple of different decks where we can look over the back deck. And it's um, kind of like s uh, observing a surgery. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. You're in the OR gallery, kind of yeah. looking down on all of this. <laughs> and um, this I have morning, to say your play-by-plays are well, yeah, well, quite we worth might the do that again too. someday. But this morning. Um, the recovery this morning, I, I don't know how many people actually got to see it. The recovery this morning was just beautiful. Mm. The, was the like ocean glass. was just glass. It was this beautiful blue. Oh, As so her cool. came up between the goal post, it was, you know, the, the, the glow of the light with the sun coming up. It was, it was just like. Yeah. Beautiful. Of course, I'm standing there as the video guy, not taking a single picture or video of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm curious, for those who are on the deck, are you able to appreciate that? Or are you s pretty focused on staying safe and getting the machines back? I mean, as when we're when we're um, when the vehicles are still kind of coming up in the water calm, um, we congregate on deck. We definitely do take a moment to look at the yeah before center. and after. Yeah, yeah. Right after. And it's it's funny. Well, what Jeff was saying.